and admit some more people. There we go. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I am Bethany Gaunt, Associate Director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre, which was established in memory of the late British historian. Sir Martin worked on a wide range of topics, publishing an amazing 88 books on 20th century history. He had a particular gift for bringing history alive to his audiences, and our aim at the centre is to bring the finest historical research to the public and make history accessible and engaging for all. On which note, tonight we'll be trialling a new format, which we hope you will enjoy, but more on that in just a moment. Um, the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre is a charity, so we are grateful for any donations you might want to make. It's now easy to donate on our website, and I'll add the link in the chat in just a moment. For tonight's talk, I'm very pleased to welcome back Lady Esther Gilbert for another set of readings from Sir Martin's work. Esther is, as many of you will know, Sir Martin's widow, and she founded this centre together with Sir Harry Solomon, our Chair of Trustees. Esther came to know Sir Martin through his writing, and in their years together, she shared many research trips with him, supporting him with his writing commitments. She continues to work tirelessly to keep his books available and his legacy alive. She redesigned his website and writes monthly e-newsletters that focus on his work and approach. I'll add the link to her website in the chat, and you can visit it to subscribe to her newsletter or to contact Esther directly. Today, Esther will be presenting a series of readings from Sir Martin's books on the Vansay Conference, which took place 80 years ago today. Her readings will be followed by a short video of Sir Martin and a presentation of several relevant maps. We think this will probably take us to shortly before 8 p.m. UK time. And at this point, I will switch off the recording and we'd like to invite you to share your own insights into the his this historical moment and ask Lady Esther any questions you might have. We do hope that you'll enjoy this longer, more relaxed format and the chance to speak yourselves. But if, of course, if you don't wish to speak out loud and for any questions that might arise while Esther is speaking, please just post these in the chat as usual. You can, you can do that publicly or message me directly and we can turn to those at the end of the presentation. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Esther. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bethany. Welcome, everyone. 80 years ago today, in one day, the world changed. The definition of evil changed. The parameters of what constitutes what used to be called man's inhumanity to man changed. A group of men had a meeting. In the main, they were bureaucrats, heads of departments, men who came together, discussed their agenda, and then had a brandy after their discussion before going home to their families. They met at a beautiful villa on a lake. The villa shares the same name as the lake and their meeting thus became known as the Vonsay Conference. The meeting revolved around the logistics of committing murder and taking it to a level of industrial means and methods and proportions that involved the whole of Europe and targeted an entire people. As always, I ask, what would Martin say? Well, luckily, he said quite a lot. This um, is from his book, Never Again, by way of introduction. On 20 January 1942, 13 senior Nazi and German officials met at a secluded lakeside villa on the shores of the Wannsee, a few miles from Berlin. They had been summoned by SS General Reinhard Heydrich, who told them that he had just been appointed plenipotentiary for the, patent, for the preparation of the final solution of the European Jewish question. The aim of the meeting, Heydrich explained, was to coordinate the work of Hitler's chancellery, the SS Race and Resettlement Office, the Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories, the Ministry of the Interior, the Justice Ministry, the Foreign Office and several other government departments. Also brought into, this, this, into the discussion, having made the journey from Krakow by train were senior officials of the general government. Also present at Vansay 
were the head of the German four-year plan responsible for the disposing of Jewish property and Adolf Eichmann in charge of the Gestapo's Jewish affairs section together with his chief, the head of the, of the Gestapo, Heinrich Mueller. We turn now to Martin's Second World War, a complete history for a bit more background. Among the Germans present, summoned there by Heydrich, was the newly appointed state secretary of the Reich Ministry, the Reich Ministry of Justice, Roland Friesler, and a leading member of the German Foreign Ministry, Martin Luther, whose task was to persuade the governments of Europe to cooperate in what was called deceptively the final solution of the Jewish question. The aim, Heydrich explained, was that all 11 million Jews in Europe should, quote, fall away. To find them, Europe would be combed from west to east. The representative of the general government, Dr. Joseph Buhler, had, quote, only one favor to ask, that the Jewish question in the general government be solved as rapidly as possible. Another participant, Wilhelm Stuckhardt, who had helped to draw up the 1935 Nuremberg Laws, turning Jews into second-class citizens and outcasts, proposed compulsory sterilization of all non-Aryans and the forcible dissolution of all mixed marriages between Jews and non-Jews. But it was the work of the gas bands at Helno, which was to be the model. Since the second week of December, more than a thousand Jews a day and many gypsies had been taken from their homes and villages in Western Poland, packed into the vans and killed during the drive from Chelmno Church to the nearby wood. In the months following the Vonsei Conference, similar gassing vans and gas chambers using diesel fumes were to be set up at three further camps, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. Although remote, each camp was on a railway line. It was to be by rail that almost all the deportees were brought and killed. Only a handful needed for menial work in the camps were kept alive. There was no selection of able-bodied men and women who might work in factories or farms. All who arrived, men and boys, women and girls, children, the old, the sick, and the able-bodied were murdered. Death by gassing and by systematic killing was the final as opposed to any other solution, whether emigration or forced labor or death by mass shooting. To ensure that the final solution worked smoothly, that the deportations were orderly and systematic and that adequate deceptions worked throughout, Heydrich chose a senior officer, Adolf Eichmann, to carry out the von Say decisions. When the conference was over, Eichmann later recalled Quote, we all sat together like comrades, not to talk shop, but to rest after long hours of effort. It was on January 20, the day of the Vonsei Conference, that a young Jew, Yakov Bryanovsky, having escaped from the labor gang at Chelno, which was being forced to bury the bodies when they were thrown out of the gas vans, reached the nearby village of Grabo. Seeking out the local rabbi, Bryanovsky told him, Rabbi, don't think I'm crazed and have lost my reason. I am a Jew from the nether world. They are killing the whole nation of Israel. I myself have buried a whole town of Jews, my parents, brothers, and the entire family. In German-occupied Europe, a pattern of war and resistance was emerging. Hitler's plan did not envisage Jewish resistance or survival. On January 23, three days after the Vonsei Conference had given administrative backing to the final solution, Hitler told his entourage in Himmler's presence, quote, one must act radically. When one pulls out a tooth, one does it with a single tub and the pain quickly goes away. The Jew must clear out of Europe. 
if the Jews were to, quote, break their pipes on the journey, Hitler commented, I can't do anything about it, but if they refuse to go voluntarily, I see no other solution but extermination. So what are we talking about here? What are the plans? This from Martin's book, The Holocaust. Hitler then explained that this fine, sorry, we're back at the meeting. Heydrich then explained that this final solution concerned, concerned only those Jews, sorry, not only those Jews who were already under German control, but some 11 million Jews throughout Europe. He then gave a meet, the meeting a list of the numbers involved, including 330,000 Jews in as yet unconquered Britain. All the Jews in the neutral countries of Europe were also listed, 55,500 in European Turkey, 18,000 in Switzerland, 10,000 Jews in Spain, 8,000 Jews in Sweden, 4,000 Jews in the Irish Republic, and 3,000 in Portugal. The figures presented by Heydrich included 34,000 for Lithuania, the other 200,000 Jews of pre-war Lithuania had, though he did not say so, been murdered between July and November 1941 by Einsatzgruppe A. Their numbers meticulous, meticulously listed town by town and village by village in Colonel Jaeger's report of 1 December 1941. The largest number of Jews listed by Hydra were those in the Ukraine. His figure was 2 million 994,684. The second largest was for the general government, 2,284,000. The third largest was for Germany's ally Hungary, 742,800, a figure which included the Jews in Ruthenia, Transylvania, and those of Czechoslovakia annexed by Hungary in 1938 in 1939. The fourth highest figure was for unoccupied France, 700,000, a figure which included the Sephardi Jews in France's North African possessions, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Next largest in the list was White Russia, 446,484, followed by the 400,000 Jews in the Bialystok region. Hungary was Germany's ally. Jews living in five other countries, which were allied to Germany, were also listed. 342,000 in Romania, 88,000 in Slovakia, 58,000 in Italy, including Sardinia, 40,000 in Croatia, and 2,300 in Finland. The smallest, the smallest number given was the 200 Jews of Italian occupied Albania. Estonia was listed as quote, without Jews. This was true. Of Estonia's 2000 Jews in June, 1941, half had fled to safety inside the Soviet Union while half had already been killed by the Einsatz Commando. On January 30, nine years after coming to power in Germany, and only 10 days after the conference on the shore of Wannsee, Hitler spoke at the Sports Palace in Berlin of his confidence in victory. He also spoke of the Jews, telling his listeners, as reported by the Allied Monitoring Service on the following day, quote, they are our old enemy as it is. They have experienced at our hands an upsetting of their ideas. And, rightfully, they, and they rightfully hate us just as much as we hate them. The Germans, Hitler added, were well aware that the war could only end when the Jews had been uprooted from Europe or when they disappear. Hitler then declared, as recorded by the Allied Monitoring Service, the war will not end 
as the Jews imagine it will, namely with the uprooting of the Aryans. But the result of this war will be the complete annihilation of the Jews. Such was Hitler's message as received in London and Washington. The war would end with the complete annihilation of the Jews. Even as Hitler spoke, new death camps were being prepared. Three of the sites chosen were remote villages in the former German-Polish border, just to the west of the River Burg. Although remote, each site was on a railway line, linking it with hundreds of towns and villages whose Jewish communities were now trapped and starving. The first site at Belgetz had been a labor camp in 1940, the railway there linking it with the whole of Galicia. From Krakow in the west to Lvov in the east and beyond, and with the whole of the Lublin district. The second site at Treblinka, also, also, also the site of an existing labor camp, was linked by rail through both Malkinia Junction and Siedlice with Warsaw and the Warsaw region. The third site at Sobibor, a woodland halt where Jewish prisoners of war had been murdered in 1940, linked by rail to many large Jewish communities, among them Glodova and Chelm. Later camps were to be set up at which as many as half of the deportees were selected for forced labor. But at Helmno, Belgetz, Sobibor, and Treblinka, no such selections were made. In these four camps, between the early months of 1942 and the first months of 1943, many hundreds of Jewish communities were to be wiped out in their entirety, more than 50 communities at Helmno alone. Yet within a few months, Helmno was to, pro was to prove the second smallest of the four death camps, a camp at which nevertheless, at least 360,000 Jews were killed within a year. A fifth camp was also set up in the spring of 1942, an, ex an extension of an existing camp, Auschwitz. Situated across the railway line from Auschwitz main camp where Polish prisoners suffered cruel torments, a new camp was in a Birchwood known in German as Birkenau. At the railway yard near Auschwitz station, a selection was to be made of each incoming train, and as many as half of those brought to the camp were to be selected, not for gassing, but for forced labor. The labor was first in the camp itself, and subsequently in the surrounding factories of Upper East Upper Silesia, soul mines, coal mines, synthetic coal and rubber factories, and other military and industrial enterprises. From each train, however, of a thousand deportees, at least 500 were to be gassed within a few hours of their arrival. All old people, all those who were sick, all cripples, and all small children. The gassings took place at first in a gas chamber in Auschwitz main camp, or in specially constructed gas chambers in the birch wood. Auschwitz, Auschwitz was not a remote village in Eastern Poland, but a large town at a main railway junction in a region annexed to the German Reich. The railway was part of the main line with direct links to every capital of Europe, to the old Reich, to Holland, France, and Belgium, to Italy, and to the Polish railway network. Fewer Jews were to be killed at Auschwitz-Birkenau than at the four death camps combined, but far more Jews were to survive Auschwitz-Birkenau, having been selected for slave labor, than were to survive the four death camps. Indeed, from Belgetz, there would be no more than two survivors. From Helno, only three. From Treblinka, less than 40. And from Sobibor, a total of 64. While from Auschwitz-Birkenau, several thousand Jews were to survive. But in February 1942, all this was in the future. The, spe the special gas chambers in these camps 
were still under construction, except at Falno, whose gas vans had been working throughout without interruption since 8 December 1941. By the time of the Vansay conference, three special gas vans were in operation at Helmno. At the beginning, Jews were brought to Helmno daily, recalled Andre Mischak, a resident of Helmno village. The, the gendarmes used to say, Ein Tag, Ein Tausend, one day, one thousand. How was this going to work? What was known at the time and, and what was the context? This is from Martin's book, Auschwitz and the Allies. Those Jews who were forced into the cattle trucks and those who watched them go were told that the trains were going to work camps in the East. The Jews of Poland were to be resettled in a more distant land. Greater Germany and the general government of Poland were to be made Jew free. But the Nazis added there was room enough for the Jews elsewhere. If they went quietly, no harm would come to them. If they resisted, they would be shot. The Nazi promises seemed plausible enough. All over Europe, labor camps had indeed been built to serve the needs of Germany. Camps and ghettos in which clothes factories, armament factories, and, mach and machine tool factories made use of Jewish slave labor to help the German war machine. Conditions were harsh and rations meager. Many died of starvation or of deliberate brutality by the German guards, but it was still possible to survive. And it was to some, and it was to some such camps, so the Nazis promised that these deportations of 1942 were bound. The deportation trains had, however, only one destination, a death camp somewhere in the East. The fact that the Germans had been murdering Jews in Europe was well known to the Allies. Since the outbreak of the war, German brutality had received wide publicity, but none of the Allies yet knew that these killings were part of a deliberate plan to murder every Jew in Europe. The Vance Conference and the setting up of the Eastern death camps had been closely guarded secrets. The deliberate attempt to destroy systematically all of Europe's Jews was unsuspected in the spring and early summer of 1942, the very period during which it was, during which it was at its most intense and during which hundreds of thousands of Jews were being gassed every day at Belzec, Chelno, Sobibor, and Treblinka. The murder of Jews during the first two years of the war had aroused, had aroused much public sympathy. The war was being fought, after all, against the evils of the Nazi system. But with the United States remaining neutral throughout those first two years, with France defeated and Britain alone, there was nothing that could be done to loosen the Nazi grip on Europe. Even after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, Russia, far from being an effective ally, seemed more likely to succumb to the German attack. The United States did not enter the war until Je December 1941. She too, in the early months of 1942, was in a weak position, losing vast territories to Japan and the Pacific, and having little immediate involvement in Europe beyond his, Hitler's own, own ill-timed declaration of war. At the same time, the British were facing the prospect of defeat in North Africa at the hands of Rommel's Africa Corps. Thus it was that the beginning of the final solution in March 1942 coincided with the moment at which the Allies were at their weakest. In several ways, it was intended to do so. It was the Nazi aim to murder the Jews of Europe without provoking a world reaction, to do so secretly and silently, and to complete the task while Britain, Russia, and the United States could do nothing about it.
why was this gassing the method needed and how to do it? What were the technical arrangements? This from Martin's book, Final Journey. Mass shootings, as in Russia, would be much more difficult to carry out, if not impossible, in countries like France, Holland, Belgium, Norway, or Italy, where the local population might be sympathetic to the Jews and would certainly be disgusted by the work of the Einsatzgruppen and might even be provoked to protest. There were only a few countries where the local population could be relied on to do the work themselves, as happened in the Croatian region of Yugoslavia, where local fascists murdered more than 20,000 Jews. To transport a total of more than 3 million people by rail across Europe to the death camps and labor camps of the East, railway timetables had to be devised, wagons hired, frontier crossing points organized, shunting arrangements perfected, and whole, com com and whole communities uprooted by means of registration centers, confinement to special sections of towns, deportations to special holding camps, and a regular system of dispatch to the East. In addition to the technical arrangements involving thousands of trains and tens of thousands of miles, a complex system of subterfuge had to be created, whereby the idea of resettlement could be made to appear a tolerable one. All this was done by Eichmann's section, whose representatives were to be active in France Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Norway, Romania, Greece, Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. Regular meetings were held in, in Berlin to coordinate the dispatch of full trains and the return of empty trains. One of the railway documents which survives is dated Berlin, 13 January, 1943. Signed by Dr. Jacobi of the General Management Railway Directorate East in Berlin, it took the form of a telegraphic letter addressed to the General Directorate of East Railways in Krakow, the Prague Group of Railways, the General Traffic Directorate Warsaw, the Traffic Directorate Minsk, and the Railway Directorates in 14 cities, including Breslau, Dresden, Konigsberg, Minsk, Mines and Vienna. Copies were to be sent in addition to the General Management Directorate South in Munich and to the General Management Directorate West in Essen, a total distribution of 20 copies. The subject was special trains for resettlers during the period from 20 January to 28 February, 1943. Also under Dr. Jacobi's schedule, a deportation of Polish Jews in train number 127 was dispatched from Bialystok at 9 a.m., 9 February, 1943, reaching the death camp at Treblinka at 12.10, and returning empty that same evening from Treblinka as train number 128, leaving Treblinka at 9.18 p.m. and reaching Bialystok 90 minutes after midnight. The instructions of 13 January 1943 had referred specifically to the return of the empty trains. The last paragraph of the instructions read, quote, train formation is noted for each recirculation and attention is to be paid to these instructions. After each full trip, cars are to be well cleaned if need be fumigated and upon completion of the program, prepared for further use. Number and kinds of cars are to be determined upon dispatch of the last train and are to be, to re and are to be reported to me by telephone with confirmation on service cards. Each aspect of the railway deportations involved a substantial number of people. Gestapo bureaucrats hired trains from the various regional directorates Railway men took charge of the shunting and signaling, whereby each train was forwarded to its destination. 
Bills of lading were prepared. Checklists of trains and passengers were signed and countersigned and return tickets were issued for the train guards. Not only were profits to be made from the belongings of those who were murdered, but even the cost of the railway journeys were to be paid for by the Jews themselves. At the time of the deportation of the Jews of Greece from Salonika to Auschwitz, the Gestapo had ordered special trains from the Greek state railways at a cost of nearly 2 million Reichsmark. A year after the deportations, in which more than 40,000 people were sent to their deaths, payment had still not been made. This led to an angry letter being sent from Dr. Rao of the Ministry of Transport in Berlin to the Army High Command. The letter was dated 1 March 1944. In it, Dr. Rao pointed out that Himmler himself, the Gestapo chief, had agreed over the telephone that the cost of deporting the Jews from Salonika, quote, were to be borne from confiscated Jewish property. It was the military commander of the Aegean area who was in charge of all confiscated Jewish property, hence this letter. Dr. Rao continued. The fare owed to the Greek state railways as dispatcher of the trains for the benefit of all participating railways is 1,938,488 Reichsmark. Repeated attempts were made to collect this amount from the above mentioned office, the military commander, unfortunately without results so far. I ask that this matter be cleared up with the Reichsführer SS and chief of the German police command security police, and that care be taken to assure transmittal of the transport costs to the directorate of the Greek state railways. Kindly inform me about the progress of negotiations. The Jews of these deportations had been murdered nearly a year before. Nevertheless, the process of making them pay for their final journey continued. In 1996, Martin took his Holocaust MA students to Europe, to the places they had studied. He kept a, a diary of the trip, and it was published as Holocaust Journey, Traveling in Search of the Past. This is um, from Martin's diary, standing in front of the Vonce Villa. Standing in the forecourt, before we entered the villa itself, I give a summary of what was said and decided here 54 years ago. Finally, the, he describes it, and then finally the meeting was drawing to an end. Finally, the official notes recorded, quote, there was a discussion of the various types of solution possibilities. What these possibilities were, the notes of the conference did not record. At his trial in Jerusalem in 1960, Eichmann told the court, quote, I remember that at the end of this Vance conference, Heydrich, Mueller, and my humble self settled down comfortably by the fireplace. And that then for the first time, I saw Heydrich smoke a cigar or a cigarette. And I was thinking, today Heydrich is smoking, something I've not seen before. And he drinks cognac, since I have not seen Heydrich take any alcoholic drink in years. After this Vance conference, we were sitting together peacefully, and not in order to talk shop, but, into, but in order to relax after the long hours of strain. What Eichmann called the long hours of strain were over. It had all taken less than a day. Heydrich was certain that the time was right for the deportation and destruction of millions of people. The technical services such as the railways, the bureaucracy, and the diplomats would work in harmony toward a single aim. Local populations would be cajoled or coerced into passivity. Many would even cooperate, and some would cooperate gladly. That had been made clear already. The time has now come for us to enter the villa. It's now a memorial consisting of a museum, 
and an educational center. It has an archive and a library and a department which organizes study days and seminars. Up to now, 1996, 210,000 visitors, groups and individuals have found their way like us to this door. We walk up the path, some hesitating and then enter. As we walk around the villa, it quickly becomes clear that the presentation is most impressive. The, the story of the Holocaust is set out in the downstairs rooms with clear explanations and excellent photographs and facsimile documents. There are 14 rooms with exhibits and a 15th room with the history of the villa before 1939 and after 1945. We walk through the rooms in our historical sequence, the National Socialist Dictatorship in Germany, the pre-war period, the war against Poland, 1939, the ghettos, mass executions in German-occupied Russia after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June, 1941, the Vance Conference itself, deportations, the Hall of the Countries, death camps and transit camps. Auschwitz, a room on its own, concentration camps, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the end and liberation. In what is believed to have been the actual room in which the Vance Conference took place, with its tall picture windows looking out over the patio and lawn down to the lake, there is a stillness. We walk into the room, through it, round it, and then out of it, as if it must not be disturbed. It is, as, it is as if the voices of those who spoke here and the heads of those who nodded their agreement here must not be alerted to our presence. One feels a palpable sense of the presence of evil. Despite the bright sunshine outside and the large windows, the room seems eerily dark. Along one wall are the photographs of all those who were at the meeting and descriptions of who they were, most of them professional civil servants of the highest degree of bureaucratic competence. In 2009, Martin and I were part of a uh, film called The Rescuers, Heroes of the Holocaust, in, uh, in which we went around Europe with, um, on the trail of righteous diplomats, those diplomats who had saved Jews. We were in Vonsay and I have, if I can do this, uh, a film clip of Martin at the Vonsay Villa, which I'd like to share with you. And we'll see if I can actually do this. This is the room where it all happened, where the fate of more than three million Jews was decided. The 20th of January 1942. Adolf Eichmann, he had been responsible for the first solution. He had been in Berlin, in Vienna, in Prague, supervising the immigration of more than 350,000 German and Austrian Jews. And when war came in September 1939, other solutions were felt needed as almost 3 million Polish Jews came under German rule. And so this gentleman, Reinhard Heydrich, head of the SS Security Service, the SD. He thought up the second solution, put the Jews in ghettos and starve them to death over three, four, five, six, seven, eight years. That was a cruel solution. And here we have Dr. Rudolf Lack, one of the eight doctors of jurisprudence who were at this meeting of 14 experts. 
Dr. Langer was one of those who participated in the third solution. <laughs> Mass murder with machine guns, murdering people town by town, village by village. And it was Langer who was one of those who led to the fourth and final solution. <laughs> because Langer complained to Berlin that shooting people with machine guns, shooting 50,000 people, they didn't have enough ammunition. It was a, a waste of ammunition. He said, my SS men don't like shooting at people of our German culture. They don't want to do it. Some of them have iron crosses. They won in the First World War for bravery fighting in the German army. We must find some other solution. And so Heidegger organized this meeting to decide on a final solution. And each one had a different part to play. They were discussing the methods of extermination. Should it be by gas? Each one had a different expertise. Should it be in trucks with gas vans? Each one was very ridiculous. Round the Jews up in the streets of France and Holland and Belgium and Italy and Hungary, all over Europe. Deport them great distances, send them by train somewhere in the east. No one need know what it is. It's unknown destination. And organize all the numbers on those lists, all they could find, all they could round up, all who couldn't hide. And in most of the death camps, all who arrived were murdered. There's no photograph in this chamber of horrors of the man who initiated Adolf Hitler. He said, Jewish question, to be exterminated. I'd like to show you some of Martin's maps, if I can. Okay. Here, I thought I was doing so well with this. Where do I go on? Like this. There. Can everyone see that? I think you need to share your screen again. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Just a sec. Sorry. Perfect. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. So uh, this is Martin's um, maps of the 11 million Jews. The one on the left is the Jews who were in German occupied or controlled areas. And the map on the right is um, the Jews who were in Britain and uh, neutral countries at that point. These are the, uh, the first camp, death camp, the principal deportations to Kelno and to end Kelno camp itself. These are the deportations uh, to Belgets in the Belgets camp. The deportations in the area to Sobibor in the Sobibor camp. The deportations to Treblinka and Treblinka can. Deportations from Thrace and Macedonia. Thrace and Macedonia were at that time under uh, occupation by Bulgaria, and the Jews there were deported to Treblinka. And um, Sobibor had mainly Polish Jews, but there were deportations from Westerbork in Holland to Sobibor. 
And the map on the left shows the, uh, the trains, the deportation routes from Bergen in the north, from Rhodes in the south, from France, from Norva to Auschwitz, and the, and the Auschwitz uh, three camps. Can you see, can you see that whole? Yes, okay, good. So you'll see that Auschwitz main camp, the small red square just to the left of the Sola River was the main camp, Auschwitz I. Um, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, you can see the size in comparison. Uh, there was one gas chamber in Auschwitz, in Auschwitz and three in Birkenau. And on the right, the uh, Buna Monowitz factory uh, located in the town of, of Monowitz. They were trying to produce Buna, a uh, synthetic rubber, which they never actually produced. And the Monowitz slave labor camp and below it, the two um, British prisoners of war camps. And then this is uh, Auschwitz and Birkenau. Now, I had said to Mark and I have a vague idea of what the size of the North America is, but I don't have an idea of what uh, German occupied Europe was. So he did a map and, and put it on top of North America and you have a sense of the size. Now, if you can see Auschwitz, the uh, swastika in the center and Lvov to its right, everything sort of east of Lvov was, was the, the murder choice was um, by, by machine gun and everything west of Lvov where all uh, Jews were taken to, to death camps. And, um, and, and, and that's it. Let me see if I can stop sharing. Back to where we are. No. If I close this, what happens? Are we all together? We've done it. <laughs> Slowly I'm getting there. I'm a technological dinosaur. Thank you for this. I'm happy to try and answer any questions you have or comments you'd like to make or memories if you've been there. In the bottom of your Zoom screen is a yellow hand. And if you click on it, when it appears in your box, um, we will unmute you. Before I turn the mic back to Bethany, I'd like to say that the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center is a charity. The pandemic and Zoom has enabled us to reach you uh, wherever you are and bring these programs to you. With your help, we will be able to continue to do so. And I'll see that I see that there's some things in the chat. So I'll leave it to Bethany now. Thank you, Esther. That was a really brilliant presentation. And congratulations on getting the, <laughs> the PowerPoint to work. I know that's been weighing on your mind. Um, it was very moving to see that clip of Sir Martin there at the end. Um, for those of you who might not know, Esther is so dedicated bringing these presentations to you. And I know the amount of work that you've put into it. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, to me, it always seems particularly powerful to hear about these historical events when we're on the day itself on which they took place years ago. So I am looking forward, I said this before we, um, we let people in today. I'm looking forward to hearing what you're going to talk about next, which, which anniversary you're going to choose for your next series of readings, and I hope there will be one. Um, but for now, we are very excited to try out a longer discussion format to end tonight. Um, we've got a, a tentative idea of timings, but we're flexible. Um, and, and at the end of the discussion, to conclude, we're hopefully going to hear from a special guest who will share their own experience of being at the villa in Vance. So please do stick around for that. Um, if we don't get through everyone's questions tonight, please send us an email and we'll try and answer any burning questions you have, but we will try and hear from everyone that wants to speak today. As Esther has said, we would ask that you use the raise hand function, which is along the bottom of your screen, um, uh, and we'll, we'll try and get to you in turn. You can also message if you don't want to speak out loud, that's fine. Um, and please, to avoid issues with feedback and echoes, if you could remain muted when you're not speaking, that would be great. And just finally, as we experiment with a more vocal discussion, please bear with us and be respectful of everyone here tonight. So I'm going to stop the recording now, um, just so 
everybody feels free and at ease 